have you all join us again for our second presentation. And so the topic for today, of course, is keeping the peace. And even though we are more focused with Lee Summit Cares on parenting per and providing resources to parents, we all know that conflict is a part of life. And so I would like for you to think about this presentation tonight in terms of ways in which you can help um, your kids learn conflict management skills, but also for yourself. Um, because conflict is a part of life and our kids certainly learn through the example we set as well as through the different experiences that we have. Um, tonight I'm going to try to do a better job of time management and so the plan is for me to talk for about 30 minutes and then spend time um, going ahead and addressing any questions, uh, specific scenarios that you might have. And so I appreciate your patience as I continue to get comfortable using the webinar format, and um, we'll just keep moving forward here. Uh, just briefly, if you weren't here last time, I uh, just wanted to introduce my family to you. Uh, quickly, uh, I'm on the left, my husband's on the right. Phil and I have been married for 27 years. We have four children ranging in age from 14 to 25. Uh, and then these are, of course, our fur babies, uh, Charlie, and Gus are in the top right hand corner and then uh, Lucy our cat who that is Lucy our cat that is her personality. So uh, let's move forward and talk about what we're going to be addressing tonight. Um, tonight we're going to talk about teaching and modeling conflict resolution. Um, so conflict is something that is unavoidable really uh, in terms of relationships and interacting with others. Um, we are now spending, I think we're on week four, it's hard to keep track of time, um, but in more close proximity to family members. And so there's a lot more opportunities for us to have conflict. And so even outside of COVID-19 though, conflict is a part of life. And so we're gonna talk about how to address that. Uh, it, as we do that, um, we're gonna talk about assertive communication strategies. And so these are uh, suggestions on things to take care of your uh, personal needs, as well as communicating those needs to others in a positive way. We're gonna talk about different techniques for how do you diffuse conflict when you experience it. And finally, I'm gonna share with you two things. Uh, the first is a five-step problem-solving guide that will help you when you're working with your kids to help them to resolve conflicts. And then the second piece is Kelso's Choices, which is something that is very common that we use, um, that educators use within school districts to help empower kids in, uh, as young as elementary school age to resolve different conflicts that they encounter. So let's start with our first poll for the evening. I can get this to move forward. Sometimes it likes to move forward, somewhat, sometimes it doesn't. So I just want to touch, touch base with everyone. Um, the conflict barometer in your home poll, right? Just mentioned we're going in on our fourth week uh, in stay at home orders. And so here are your options. Rachel's going to go ahead and post the poll. And I'm going to give you a few minutes to go ahead and respond. Once you click on which response applies to you, <laughs> oh wow, go ahead and uh, be sure to enter and then we'll be, we'll be good to go. One thing that I love about this is just the reality that this opportunity allows us to have. And I know that I've certainly myself been probably balancing between tolerable and hair on fire at different points for different reasons. And so it looks like I'm going to go ahead and share our results. And so, um, well, this is good. What conflict I've been avoiding my family. So all of you are coming out uh, into the, the home and facing each other and going about your day. Uh, tolerable, we're at about 69%, and hair on fire, get me out of here. Yeah, 
you know, stress levels are definitely increasing. And so we're going to be moving on to talk about some different solutions to the stress that we're experiencing. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and log out of this and we're going to move on and talk about what are some of those different things that are causing you stress. And so if you want to start thinking about that, I think my computer is working a little bit slow tonight. Um, but if you want to start thinking ahead to the types of things that are causing you, especially those of you who are feeling like hair on fire, we're going to start recording those in our chat box to the right side. But first, let's talk about what conflict is. Uh, basically, a condition that presents itself when incompatible beliefs or goals are placed in opposition to one another. Um, I always like this comment here, and you might be experiencing a little bit of this at, well, uh, I'm not arguing, I'm explaining why I'm right. And the reality is it's, it's hard uh, to see another person's perspective and to slow down and to take some time to really consider where that person is coming from so that we can put things in perspective and work towards resolving that conflict in a peaceful way. Um, conflict resolution is certainly something that we learn over time and is something that is also influenced by the role models that we've had as we ourselves were growing up. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our our next slide and this is the one where we're going to focus in on what are the types of conflicts that you're experiencing and so a few that i came up with as possibilities to get people thinking um, was the internal conflict is you know is it safe to go to the store you know you might be concerned about um you know just to, are you going to get exposed to something and so there's some conflict and even leaving your house even when you need to get something many people are dealing with the conflict of just balancing work from home but also having the kids on top of you um, some of you might have kids that are interrupting you periodically to see hey are you done yet um, which can certainly create an increase in stress um, how about how many of you are experiencing kids who are fighting, you know, fighting about anything or everything? Um, you know, sibling rivalry is very common, and yet having us together more often is going to increase the opportunities for that sort of thing. Some people might be dealing with not having enough space to work just to get away. Um, uh, maybe some kids are being disrespectful. I know that I've heard from a few parents of teenagers in particular that have been disrespectful in terms of their words and the manner in which they're communicating with their parents. Um, and, and of course, there's the online learning. And so if you have anything additional that you would like to add to this list, or perhaps this, this list already speaks to you, if you want to go ahead and put that in the chat box at any time, um, that would be great because what I'll be doing is going back to some of those different examples that you provide for me and then talking about how to apply the different strategies to those particular situations. So we'll just leave that open opportunity at, uh, for you. So some things we need to know about conflict. Um, Conflict, if left alone, will take care of itself or even disappear on its own, all right? As I said earlier, we know that dealing with conflict is something that's really uncomfortable. And so some people choose to avoid it, but the reality is that when we avoid conflict, a few things happen. Uh, one is it tends to grow bigger and the other thing is it's, it's almost like if you're feeling angry about something, those feelings build up inside and they start to leak out, if you will. And so you might find yourself snapping at someone um, and, and not even realizing you know, why until it's already out, out of your mouth. Um, so conflict doesn't just go away. The other thing is that conflict must be resolved and all conflicts can be resolved. 
Um, many of you, I'm sure, already know that sometimes the best course of action is to agree to disagree, or perhaps maybe we need to compromise as a way to resolve this conflict. Um, not all conflicts can be resolved. Sometimes we're just going to take a different perspective on things and we need to move on. Um, conflict always results in a winner or a loser and a loser. Um, some people experience that mindset because of the manner in which conflict may have been resolved for them in their own home, uh, where it was not a collaborative process where everyone was, you know, taking turns listening to different perspectives and working towards the common good. Um, but the reality is that conflict can be resolved in a way in which people don't lose but that it can be a win-win situation. And so we're gonna talk about how to up the odds that that happens. And finally, the last one I, I wanted to bring up is that the belief that conflicts must be resolved in one discussion. The reality is oftentimes conflict uh, resolution takes place over a series of conversation. Um, this is especially true as kids grow older where we might share a concern that we have and want to wait and hear what their feedback is and then take some time to think about it. And so know that conflict isn't something that has to be solved right here, right now, but oftentimes it's to the advantage to have a conversation that takes place over the course of time, especially when it's a situation that's been going on for a while or that has a lot of hot buttons uh, for everyone who's involved. And so do keep those things in mind as you think about attitudes and mindsets as we approach the conflict in our lives. Our next slide. Ah, our next slide is important because as we're teaching our kids how to resolve the conflict in their lives, we need to have a good sense for what are our tendencies. Now, I mentioned a little while ago that how we resolve conflict is typically influenced by a few things. One would be the role models that we've had in our life. And so how others have modeled for us conflict uh, resolution strategies is gonna be a big influencer. The other thing is certainly our experiences that we've had with conflict. And we might even add in our personality or temperament. Things to keep in mind as we're doing this, as you look at this diagram, we wanna be thinking about when we're dealing with conflict, essentially, as we talked about earlier, it's because our goals are opposing. You know, someone wants to watch one TV show whereas someone else wants to watch something else. And so we need to think about what, what is it that I want to see happen in terms of an end goal here. The other piece is the importance of relationship. Um, I joked last week that when uh, we are dealing with conflict in our children, uh, with our children, uh, we want to keep rela relationship at the highest priority because at some point they may, may if we need, uh, choose that nursing home for us and we want them to choose a good one, right? Um, but we know on a serious note that our relationships are, are important. That's the priority. Different conflicts are gonna come and go, but our relationship with our kids, we hope to have forever. So think about these different pieces here. If you look at the top of the diagram, uh, high, high goal, goal achieving is the focus in someone who is competing. Um, this is a person that is focused only on their needs, their wants, their desires, um, having things done their way. Uh, people who tend to compete don't really consider other people's thoughts, needs, or rights and sometimes can even uh, what we refer to as bully others into doing what they want them to do. All right, so we definitely wanna stay away from that. Collaborating is where we wanna be, because as you can see, the goals are high, 
but the relationship is importance is also rated as high, meaning I really care about this relationship. Um, I care about your needs, your interests, your perspective. And so we're going to communicate about this in a way where we can come up with a solution that works for, for both of us. All right, so that's our goal. And we're gonna get into how to do that as we move further into the presentation. Another option in orange in the middle is the compromise. This is where both parties win, but at the same time, we do that because we each choose to give up something. So we might say, fine, you can watch your show tonight, uh, but tomorrow night, here's a show that I would really like to watch. So we make up a compromise because the relationship is important and we really care about the other person. Now, things that we need to stay away from or avoid would be the avoiding. And that's where one or both parties seek to suppress the conflict. And so you might have heard of the, the statement, the elephant everyone is ignoring in the middle of the room, all right? And so no one wants to talk about it for different reasons. Maybe there's fear of how people might react to the situation or um, maybe my experience in dealing with this person, it hasn't worked out well in the past, so I really don't want to even go there now. But avoiding is not good for your physical health, neither is it good for your mental health. Um, and finally, the last one would be accommodating. Um, the problem with this, and sometimes in relationships, we do accommodate the other person, but the reality is that everyone has rights to communicate their needs, their feelings, their perspectives in an open, honest, respectful way, and also the right to be heard, all right? And so if you are someone who continually yields to another person, then you might feel a little bit like a doormat and you might feel that a little bit of resentment building up with inside you, which is also not healthy uh, for you mentally or physically. And so as you look at this, you know, I'd just like for you to be mindful and we can share these slides with you later of what do I tend to do when I am dealing with a conflict? And many of you are likely to say, well, it kind of depends on what the conflict is and who the conflict is with because we might go into different modes depending on th that unique situation. All right, so, so what do we do when we are experiencing conflict? Uh, how many of you, if anyone, you could put yourself in the chat box or raise your hand, how many of you deal with problem solving when your hair is on fire? When you're so angry that you could hardly think straight? Most of us have probably reacted in a situation where perhaps we did, um, <laughs> where we did respond quickly in a situation and then later we were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Or, or did I really just send that email that was full of emotion? Um, the first rule of thumb with, when you're dealing with conflict is that you want to address the situation when you and the other person is calm. Or if it's two kids fighting, it's, we need to separate them for until they are calm and the tears have disappeared and the redness has disappeared from their face. Because what we find is that when people are in fight flight zone, meaning their brain stem, it's really hard, well, it's impossible for them to be thinking about problem sol solving and, and how are we gonna solve this problem in, in a collaborative way, if you will, all right? So words that we can use, and I think this one works uh, wonderful, especially with teenagers. So if we have a teenager who's arguing or being disrespectful, that's definitely a conflict. And what we could say to that person is, you know, I'll be happy to discuss this you, with you when I feel treated with respect. And that's a situation where 
you're probably going to need to remove yourself from the situation because many teenagers would say, well, I am treating you with respect. And so you might get a snarky response. All right. Um, I talked about separating kids who are fighting until they are calm. And then another situation that I just brought up is maybe you need to remove yourself from the situation. You know, something has just happened where your hair is now on fire and you know, boy, if I say or do something right now, it's going to be, it's going to, it's not going to work out well. And so in that situation, we might say, you know what, this needs to be addressed, but not right now. I'm too angry. I'm going to take some time to, to cool off and calm down. We'll come back, you know, in a few hours and we'll talk about this later. All right. And so that is a way of just giving yourself an exit, but also saying, we are gonna address this, just not now until I'm, I need to be calm first, all right? So that's your first step. We always need to keep this in mind when we are experiencing a conflict, the number one rule is you have to be in control yourself and, and all the parties involved need to be in a calm place. Now these other, um, uh, diffusing techniques I'm going to go into in further detail in the upcoming slides. So we're going to get ready for another poll here as we talk about active listening, using the I statements, monitoring your tone of voice and body language, and the value of just apologizing when you made a mistake. So here's our next poll. Um, who do you think works harder? The person who's doing the talking or the person who's doing the listening. Go ahead and respond. Okay, so it looks like everybody has reported in and the majority of folks would say that it's the person who's doing the listening. Well, we also know that uh, doing the talking can be hard too for various reasons, but the reality is that listening, truly listening to another person is hard. Um, and, and because there's many things that might get in the way of us being able to listen. Um, if you'd like to, let's think, reflect on yourself for a minute here. And what are some of the things that might get in the way of you being a good listener. If you would please put any comments in the chat box, or if you would like to say something, you could raise your hand and Rachel can go ahead and unmute you and you can share with the group. Ooh, these are huge, yeah. Uh, maybe it's a situation where we have a lot of emotion you know, this is something that's really important to me. This person just really touched on one of my triggers. Um, maybe I'm hungry. You know, our physical state can have a, a huge impact on our ability to listen, as well as just feeling tired. Um, I know when my kids were in high school, they liked to come to me at about 10 o'clock at night to talk about their problems and all the things that happened during the day. Well, by 10 o'clock at night, it was time to go to bed. And so it was hard to be an effective listener when, um, you know, when you're just extremely tired. Um, how about raise your hand if you find that it's difficult to listen when someone's telling you something that you don't want to hear? <laughs> Would anyone agree with that one? And so, yeah, it could be dealing with, you know, some type of conflict or criticism or just, hey, you know, this is not, it's really hard to listen to you because I really don't want to hear what you're having to say. You know, it makes me feel uncomfortable. And from what I'm seeing here, I've got several people who are, are raising their hands as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that can get in the way of being able to listen to another person. And so we just need to be aware of that 
and do what we can to eliminate uh, different distractions and to keep ourselves in the moment uh, because listening is so important. So we're gonna move on and talk more about what that looks like. Um, I'd like you to go ahead and raise your hand again if you are someone who has someone in your life who is just an excellent listener, or maybe you're someone who other people have come to you and said, wow, you know, I just really value our relationship because you're such a good listener. So raise your hand if that would apply to you. Um, listening is critical. Uh, oftentimes, people are able to solve the problems that they have simply when they feel like other people are listening to them. When we choose to be in the moment and focus our attention specifically on what another person has to say, we're essentially communicating to that person, I care about you. You know, you're important to me. Your relationship, our relationship is important. Does that mean though that you agree with the other person? No. You know, we can really care about another person and take the time to listen to their perspective, which shows that we care, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we agree, all right? But let's focus first on the process of active listening. You know, for now, first one is to be in the moment. Um, one of the things that I find with in working with um, uh, parents of older kids, especially, is that it's more challenging to just sit down with a teenager, have eye contact, and say, "Okay, we're going to talk about your lack of motivation in school." Typically, that does not work out very well to have that direct type of communication. It feels a little threatening. And so oftentimes what does work well is to have the discussion with your older child or even a younger child when you're doing some type of activity that you both enjoy. Um, when my kids were younger, we would go for walks or we would you know, do crafts or we'd do our fingernails together. Of course, I have four kids. We would even go outside and shoot baskets on our basketball hoop. And by doing these things, it was a lot easier to go ahead and bring up subjects like, hey, you know, it looks like you're, you know, struggling a little bit in that algebra class. Um, tell me more about that. And oftentimes through the exercise that we were doing, the kids would start opening up and talking about what that challenge was. All right. Now, here's the thing. We need to first be in the moment and pay attention to them, all right? But the second piece is then to validate the person's feelings. How many of you, go ahead and raise your hand, if you ever have been in a conversation with someone where you felt like your feelings just didn't matter? Um, totally not a good place to be. Uh, everybody, again, we talk about our rights and that it's very important that we validate each other and that you have a right to your feelings regardless of what they are. And when people don't take the time to acknowledge and validate our feelings, oftentimes we don't feel heard, we don't feel cared for. Now here's where we have to be really careful as a parent, folks. When our kids have a problem or a conflict, it's very tempting to step in and try to solve that conflict for them or to tell them this is how you should be feeling. Or maybe they broke up with their first, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend and they're broken hearted to go to this person and say, good grief, you're going to fall in love many times. Why are you making such a big deal out of this is not very helpful. Just like if you were talking to someone who was struggling with depression, you wouldn't want to say to that person, you know, you just need to suck it up and choose to get over this. Not helpful at all. When we choose to empathize and validate with a person's feelings, it's actually very empowering. And so as your kid starts to talk, for example, about this algebra class that's incredibly hard, they can then express their feelings. 
Um, you know, it sounds like you're frustrated because the teacher isn't explaining things in a way that you understand, right? You know, we, we just keep validating and validating. And as we do that, it's important to go on to that, that next phrase or <laughs> next piece, piece, which is essentially, here's what I hear you're saying. Um, because sometimes, I'm sure you have experienced this, I have, have experienced this, I've tried to communicate something and what I said totally was misinterpreted. And so it's really important that we don't judge, that we just listen, uh, then we paraphrase back to the person, this is what I hear you saying, am I following you correctly, all right? And so that's an example of, of how we would use that paraphrasing. Uh, then the final piece is I used a situation down here where I was talking about siblings who maybe older siblings are spending more time helping out with younger siblings during this time. Kid might be frustrated about that. So we might paraphrase to that person. It sounds like you're tired of watching your brother. Confirm your understanding. It sounds like you would like more time to do the things that you would like to do without your brother. Seek first to understand. Does anyone know who coined that phrase? If you do, you could go ahead and type the name of that management guru in your chat box. There it is. All right, uh, Rachel, we need to get, get her some type of Lisa McCares award for that. All right. So I'm on it. I'm on it. I like it. Okay, so Rachel will follow up with you later. I think we're going to make this more interactive by doing just that. So think about the good listeners in your life and what are the things that these good listeners do that make you feel cared for and that your relationship is important. And like I said, we'll send these slides back to you so that you can review if you would like to. Now, when we think about how we communication, we wanna be assertive. We don't wanna be passive. We don't wanna be passive aggressive and we certainly don't wanna be aggressive. So what does it mean to be assertive? And that is essentially standing up for your personal rights and expressing your thoughts, feelings, beliefs in a direct, honest and appropriate way, all right? And so when communicating with anyone, uh, think of how would you treat a good neighbor? How would you communicate with someone you know, that you care about? And sadly, oftentimes we save our families uh, for our worst, uh, where we don't always communicate in a positive, respectful way. And so remember, communicate as if you're communicating to that good neighbor, all right? Um, when we talk about assertive communication, it's communicating how you think, feel, and how you see a situation. But at the same time, you're expressing your rights without violating the rights of another person, all right? And so that's where that seek first to understand becomes very critical. You know, we wanna communicate where we're coming from, what we need, but we also need to be aware of the needs and feelings and perspectives and rights of other people. So some examples of assertive rights that I have listed here, I'm not gonna get into these because of time, um, but something that you can refer back to, uh, a big one here is that your right to have your needs be as important as the needs of others around you, all right? You are important. That is the message we wanna communicate to our kids as well, so that as they grow up and deal with conflicts in their lives, that they feel empowered to express themselves and know that their opinions are important and deserve to be respected and considered. Um, so how do we do this in terms of when we're wanting to get a message across? Um, you've probably heard of I statements versus you statements um, for anything that you've participated in having to do with conflict and communication. I'd like for you to think about this a little differently. Um, I statements are thinking words, you statements are fighting words. And so how we express ourselves to someone is critical. So the situation might be, you know, that there's just a lot going on right now and you're feeling overwhelmed, all right? And so the I statement would be, I'm feeling overwhelmed. 
I need some help with the laundry. So you're assertively expressing what you're feeling. So you say, I feel, fill in the blank, I need, here's what I need. Instead of saying, you hardly do anything around here, go fold the clothes. That usually doesn't work out very well. Or I feel frustrated when I'm on a business call and you keep interrupting me. I need you to wait patiently until I'm finished. Or you're so inconsiderate. If you can't stop interrupting me, you're not going for a bike ride. All right. So the message and how we say the message is going to influence the person's response. They're either going to be open to hearing you or defensive and maybe even blaming someone else. The final thing that I want to, well, there's two more things I want to add here as we start wrapping up and, and I get your input on situations, is the value of apologizing. There's nothing, well, there's a lot of things that we can do to build our relationships, but the reality is that we are going to make mistakes. And choosing to be accountable when we do make a mistake, even if it's unintentional, goes a long way towards building relationships. And so this is something to consider, you know, in a situation, have I done something wrong? Own it. If you have, own it. Apologize to the other person. The only thing that will come out of that is less anger and it will help build your relationship. But also, when you acknowledge that you've made a mistake and you apologize for that, you also validate the other person or your child if it's a situation with your child. And so they then, in turn, will learn that if they make a mistake, they have been shown how to apologize and to own that behavior, which is part of developing that good character. Now, this is something that's probably familiar to some of you if you've been involved in the Love and Logic program before, but I stuck this in here because this is a guide that you can use in helping your kids to resolve some of the conflicts that they're experiencing. Step one is always sincere empathy. And so we start with perhaps saying, oh man, this is sad, or how sad, or I'm sorry, or, or that's never good. And then we move into, so what do you think you're going to do? This is how we empower our children to own that problem. Because even young children are capable of owning and thinking and working to resolve problems. Step three, if the kid says to you, I don't know, well, maybe they need some help. And so we might say, would you like to hear what other kids have tried? We don't want to say, here's what I would do, because depending on the age, they might not think that's too cool. Uh, and it's just helpful to use it from that perspective. So would you like to hear what other kids have tried? Step four, assuming that the kid is saying yes, then we're going to provide them with some consequences, but we're going to evaluate those consequences as we work our child through the problem solving situation. Um, I do recommend to parents that if they go to step three, would you like to hear what other kids have tried? I always recommend to throw out a really bad idea first for two reasons. Um, one, Kids typically will refuse the first suggestion that you give, and so you don't want to waste a good one on number one. And two, it also helps our kids to feel a sense of control, where they're actually choosing what they would like to try as a solution to that problem, all right? Um, so we're going to evaluate the consequences. So kids having a really difficult time, you know, with that algebra teacher, well, you know, some kids would choose just to, you know, blow it off and not work on that class and, and maybe take it again, you know, this summer because, you know, you're going to need that class to graduate. How would that work out? Chances are the kids are going to say, are you crazy? There's no way I want to take summer school. All right. And so we would then offer another suggestion. Well, you know, some kids might, might send an email to the teacher and set up a meeting to talk about, a, you know, some solutions to the situation. 
How might that work? Well, I don't think the teacher is really going to listen to me. She always explains it the same way. Oh, I see. I mean, then we might offer one more, you know, well, some kids might reach out to other people they know that are really good at math and see if maybe they could help guide you through the process. What do you think of that? I don't know, right? Uh, you don't have to give a multitude of ideas. The idea is to get the kid thinking, uh, then your role is to say, you know what, you're smart, you're a good problem solver, I'm confident that you can figure this out, all right? The other tip I'm gonna give you is that whenever providing a kid with possible solutions to a problem, call them experiments because in an experiment, if it doesn't work out, you still have your credibility, all right? And there's a lot of uncontrollables that we don't have. Uh, I'd tell you a story about that and how I got burned by telling a kid what to do, but we don't have time. Another time. Another suggestion here is Kelso's Choices. Um, within our local elementary schools here in Lee Summit, um, you often will see this diagram or poster put up in different classrooms. And so how you might use this when siblings are fighting is you would still start with empathy. Oh man, you know, it looks like the two of you are just not getting along right now. And then step two, well, what are you going to do? What's, what, how might you solve this problem together? Step three, you could refer them to some of these different ideas here that are pretty age appropriate for an elementary school student and frankly for an adult. Um, you know, sometimes we just need to speak up and say, hey, I really don't like it when you do that. I, I'd like you to stop. Thank you. Or sometimes it's not worth the conflict. You know, it's a little thing. I'm going to move on. I'm not going to make a big deal out of this. Um, sometimes we just need to take turns. And so this is another tool that you can go back to when you get to the point of, well, what do you think you should do? Because keep in mind, folks, that learning how to resolve conflict is not something that comes naturally. In fact, it takes a great deal of time and energy and practice to get comfortable expressing your your feelings, your needs, your wants in an assertive, healthy way. And, and we're going to make mistakes along the way. And so I like to tell people whenever they're experimenting with something new, which I hope that there's something in this presentation today that you can take back and, and experiment with and use, um, that we're focused on making progress, not being perfect. So maybe your first step is to, instead of immediately responding when someone triggers you or upsets you, that you choose to stop and count to 10. You focus on your breathing. You wait until you are calm, until you're able to have a time to calm down, think through, you know, why is this a problem for me? What do I wanna see happen here? before you go back and communicate with the person who has triggered your buttons, all right? For others, maybe you're really good at, you know, not responding or reacting immediately, that you're good at, at calming down, but maybe the words you're using are not great. Uh, you might have a tendency to use those you statements or fighting statements. And so you might need to step back and reflect on, okay, how can I say this in a more respectful way um, that's going to really just communicate my needs and what I'd like to see happen without creating defensiveness on the other person's part? And so those are some examples of things that you might walk away with and experiment with. Um, but before we wrap up, I do want to see if there's anyone who has a specific question or situation that you would like to bring up. Um, we can either unmute you, everyone's private, so no one knows who is who, um, or if you'd like, you can go ahead and type it into the chat box. That would work as well.
We haven't had, I don't see that anyone has any questions. Uh, if you do have a question, raise your hand quickly. Otherwise, we'll probably go ahead and start wrapping up today's You know what? Session. I do want to answer. There was a question about a teenager who was speaking in a very disrespectful way to a parent, um, cussing, just being horrible. And so let me go ahead and address that. And then if more questions come up, I'll be happy to answer those as well. Um, really important thing when we're parenting our kids is number one, to take care of ourselves. Um, you know, the first thing we need to do is we're going to show our kids how we expect to be treated um, through our actions. And that's something that we can't argue into them. So what I mean by that is if a, a child is ever being disrespectful to you, it's important for you to calmly set a boundary there or a limit, if you will, and say, you know what? I'll be glad to listen to you when I feel treated with respect. And at that point, you probably need to remove yourself from the situation, all right? Because the kid might start arguing with you. And if you stay, you're likely to argue back, all right? So step number one, I'll be happy to listen to you or talk with you when I feel treated with respect, or maybe it's when the arguing stops. Then we're going to turn off our brain and we're going to move on to something else. This is how we're showing the teenager how we want to be treated. All right. Then when the kid is calm, we can take some time to listen as long as they're communicating in a positive way, right? about what their need is or what their want is. But if they become disrespectful at any time, we might have to put the pause on the conversation and say, look, let's talk about this some more later when we can talk about it together in a calm way. And we might ask the, the, the teen, you know, what is it that is bothering him or her? What would they like to see happen? in terms of the situation. I've been hearing from a lot of parents about homework and kids just not being motivated to get the job done. And ultimately, while we need to be good guides to our kids and you know, making that a priority, ultimately getting that work done is gonna be the kid's ownership of that problem. That is the kid's problem. And so might we approach the situation in a different way if the arguing and conflict has to do with schoolwork? What that might sound like is I noticed that you haven't been turning in uh, papers or, or you know, really spending much time on your schoolwork. I'm concerned because I know that school is important and that you have plans for your future that you'd like to accomplish, all right? And so we'd say, so what do you plan to do? Is there, you know, how, how are you gonna deal with this situation? That's where we turn it back over to the kid. Now, if the kid says, well, I don't care, you know, I, I, this stuff isn't important anymore, we need to be careful not to get into an argument with the kid about the importance of school. All right, because if we say, yeah, it is, you know, it is important and you need to get a good education if you want to, you know, live the lifestyle you want to live, this, that, and the other thing, for some teenagers who are very strong willed, they're going to tie or they're going to embrace that school is not important, I don't care attitude, even if on some level they don't believe that. All right, and so. What we can do, though, is to ask some questions to get the kid thinking. Well, if you don't step it up and do the homework that you need to be doing, how will that affect things for you in the future and with graduation and things like that? And this is an example of when it's probably a good idea to walk away and let the kid think about that. We, a kid 
then can consider what the options are. And the message is, well, if there's anything that I can do to help, let me know. But ultimately, I am going to love you no matter how many years it takes you to get through your freshman year in high school. Right? That can be hard to say, but the reality is, you know, this is your responsibility. I'm here as a guide. I'll lead you, but ultimately, you got to make these choices. Now, folks, you got to be careful because some of our kids, um, two things. One, in Lee Summit, it seems like they've cut down the amount of work that the kids are having to do. I've noticed this in my own home where that first week it was like seven hours of work and, and my kid losing it at the kitchen table. And now it's more like two hours of work. So we don't want to assume that they're not doing what they need to do just because of the amount of time. But if we're seeing problems with the grade card, then obviously that needs to be addressed. The second thing I want you to think about as we wrap up is, is this kid depressed? You know, a lot of these kids have, are losing, just like adults, um, their connections to some degree with their peers, you know, that school environment, uh, maybe they had a support, uh, sport that they participated in, and this type of stress can trigger a mental health episode. And so if the kid, is really not even taking their care of their hygiene, you know, maybe sleeping a lot, not eating well, saying, what's the point? This is hopeless. If you're starting to hear some of those types of comments, then it's important to, to really reach out and get, get the kid evaluated. And you might be thinking, okay, how do I do that? Stay at home. You'd reach out to, uh, whoever your insurance is, your healthcare insurance to do that. And um, you can also reach out, and I wish I had that number right here. Uh, you know, ComCare First Steps to Help has a 1-800 number that people can call with concerns uh, about their kids or about themselves, just dealing with the stress of everything that everyone's going through right now. And so, Rachel, if you would do like a magic trick, I'm going to go and grab that number so I can read it to folks as we get ready to wrap up. I can type that number into the chat box too. Um, oh, good. We did have one more question come in um, from a parent of a preteen who was, okay. was interested in getting some methods for encouraging better listening. Um, he says he has a preteen who seems to not hear instructions or information from the parent and the siblings. Okay. Oh, yeah. Kids who are not listening well, um, assuming there's, I don't know, nothing else going on there, you know, um, oftentimes we as parents train our kids not to listen to us. And we certainly don't do this intentionally. We would never do it intentionally. But how it works is we might ask a child to do something and then the child doesn't follow through uh, because they're testing us essentially to see if we're being serious. And so we might ask them a second time with our voice raised a little bit this time. The kid doesn't listen, they're testing. And so this time we say, I mean it, if you don't do it right now, here's what the consequence is gonna be. So my suggestion to you is state your request one time and then follow through with some type of meaningful action, all right? If our kids know that we're gonna request something or warn them or remind something, remind them of something five times, they're gonna need five reminders before they actually get up and do what it is that you're asking them to do, all right? And so we got to be careful that we're not talking too much. Few words, meaningful actions, state the request one time, then follow through with those meaningful actions. Um, Preteens are really not very organized also. And so another option would be, um, you know, as we're talking about things that expectations that we want a kid to do throughout the day, um, we'd have a conversation about that, and um, here's what the expectations are, you know, what do you think, where can you help, or, you know, those types of things, but then find a way to write it down, 
You know, we have in our home a dry erase board where we put things on this board to communicate what's going on. We use that a lot when our kids were young. Uh, but the idea is, you know, if the listening is going back to poor organizational skills, which not a lot of preteens have good organizational skills, then what can we do to help this kid develop some type of organizational plan that helps him or her, you know, to stay on track and to get things done? Um, so those would be my two suggestions with that one. Okay, that's all the questions that came in. I am gonna just announce this out loud because the chat box won't show up on the video recording, but if your child is in crisis, you can call Calm Care First Steps for Help. Their number is 1-888-279-8188. They are multilingual. They, you can call 24 hours a day and they're always confidential. So that's 1-888-279-8188. We don't have any further questions, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap this session up. Is that good, Carrie? That sounds good. And next week we're gonna be talking about what to do uh, when you're hearing those two words, I'm bored. Um, some different suggestions and strategies for dealing with boredom. And we may have a guest join us uh, about 15 minutes before the 6.30 start time. Uh, that We will send an email out and let you know if that's going to happen. Um, but we might be talking about some different mindfulness strategies. If she can't come, I'll teach you a few. How's that sound? <laughs> Uh, but please do. I hope that you're able to join us next week. And if you come up with any additional questions after this workshop, um, you are welcome to email them, you know, to us and I will find some time to respond back to you. And I hope that you found some of the discussion here tonight to be helpful to you. Have a great night. Thanks everyone for joining us.